All right. Um, thank you. Yes, that's exactly what I'm going to do. <laughs> okay. Um, it's a great honor and privilege to be here, to be invited to speak at this great conference um, at this really great university in this beautiful building, in the middle of this beautiful city. I've never been to any of them before, and I'm very happy to be here and honored. So I'm going to be talking about uh, what I call reverse engineering the core of common sense, or the common sense core. And it's exactly as Gergo said, um, it's really a, a project that's interdisciplinary between cognitive science or the different uh, fields of cognitive science, the, the experimental psychology part, the mathematical or computational modeling part of the field, the philosophical part of the field, and also the engineering part of the field, or artificial intelligence. And the work that I do these days really sits between the science and the engineering of intelligence. I'm trying to understand human intelligence, the basic nature of intelligence in the human mind and brain, in the same kinds of terms that an engineer would use to build an intelligence system. And then one of the things that we do in our group is to, is to actually try to build more human-like intelligence in machine systems as a kind of a proof of concept. You might think it as a, as, as a kind of computational thought experiment to show that the work that we're doing on the scientific side does the engineering work that it's supposed to. Now, it's a very exciting time to be doing this kind of work between cognitive science and artificial intelligence or engineering because as you know, everybody is aware, you, 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 know, you could read the newspapers or you can just step out into the world, artificial intelligence as a field is back in a big way. But the way I like to, I, to see things is that while we have many artificial intelligence technologies, we don't yet have any real AI, and that gap is central to the work that we're doing. So we have, when I, when I say we have AI technologies, what I mean is we have all of these systems that are now and increasingly in our daily lives that do things that we used to think only humans could do. And they do them very well, sometimes at the level of the world's experts. But while we have all these wonderful technologies, or maybe wonderful, at least very powerful technologies, um, when we say that none of them is truly intelligent, what we mean is none of them has the flexible general purpose ability to think about itself in the world, to be able to do these things without having to be, in particular, built by teams of engineers. Um, each one of these systems is built by um, uh, you know, many engineers working for a number of years um, at quite expensive uh, cost. And each one just does one thing. So take AlphaGo, for example, this, you know, the recent development from DeepMind that beats the world's best Go players, and now increasingly that same algorithm uh, can be modified a little bit and trained in chess and can beat the world's best chess programs, right? But still, each, what you have is a set of programs, each of which does one thing. So AlphaGo can play Go, but it can't drive to the match. Um, it can't even tell you what Go is. It can't tell you that Go's a game or that Go's different from chess or anything like that. So what's the gap? And what is the thing that allows each human to do each of these things without having to be specially engineered? Maybe not at world-class level, but still. Now, I'll tell you in a second my version of that. Um, but in walking around this beautiful building uh, the other day, I couldn't help but um, find a very poetic uh, statement of this in this quote from George Soros that I'm sure everybody's seen as they've walked into the building either a couple of times or maybe thousands of times. Um, so let's just pause and reflect on this here. Um, Soros is talking about thinking here. I don't know exactly what he, what, what he thought he was saying, but here's what I think when I read his lines. Thinking can never quite catch up with reality. Reality is always richer than our comprehension. Reality has the power to surprise thinking, and thinking has the power to create reality. But we must remember the unintended consequences. The outcome always differs from expectations. And when I read that, I see all sorts of potential. I also see what maybe sounds a little bit like pointing to some of the limitations of thinking and how the world's sort of always out ahead of thinking. But you can also think of this as really a statement about the resilience of thinking, right? Because thinking is, thinking is in, in a goal-oriented way, is always trying to catch up with reality and noting the gaps between reality and expectations, thinks and rethinks and recreates hopefully better possibilities. So this is a more poetic way of saying the kind of thing that I'm most interested in in human intelligence right now, which is the difference between the kind of technology that's driving these uh, systems uh, uh, that we now call artificial intelligence, which is basically pattern recognition. Machine learning, various kinds of machine learning, including deep neural networks and other kinds of techniques for finding patterns in large data sets. 
But the thing that makes human intelligence so interesting to me and to many cognitive scientists is what we might think of as the capacity to build models of the world. I think that's what Soros is talking about. To be able not just to find patterns, but to explain and understand what we see. And to be able to imagine new realities that maybe have never existed. And then think about how we're going to create them. right? To formulate a problem to be solved and to plan actions to make those things real. And then maybe when experience uh, defeats our expectations or challenges them to build models or rebuild models and just to keep going and improving things. And then, of course, to be able to um, build models in a way that's social, so that involves being able to communicate our models and to be able to build across years and maybe generations of experience. So what we're trying to understand is this human capacity for modeling the world. Now, I think um, it's fair to say that we're very far from being able to do that at the kind of engineering maturity that pattern recognition has reached. Again, the kind of ideas on the engineering side that drive all these AI technologies are decades old, and they represent a maturing not only of the mathematical principles of pattern recognition, but of software and computer hardware systems that have really been transformative recently. But it's fair to say that on modeling, I'd say, on, on, the, on the more sophisticated aspects of cognition, which we call model building, we are starting to understand some things. We're starting to understand where to look, what kind of questions to ask, and maybe what some of the answers might look, at, look like. And this is really the topic, um, when, I, when I talk at, at, in the title of the talk, I said I'm thinking about the, the core of common sense. Well, this is where I think we've learned as a field to look. And in this, I'm very inspired by the work of uh, Gerge and Chibra and you know, a number of the people who are in this room and in this community. When I talk about the common sense core, I'm referring partly to the term that my local colleagues in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, Susan Carey and Liz Spelke, call core knowledge. Uh, I don't mean exactly the same thing that they do, but it's, you, you can basically assume that I mean, if you know, if you know what they mean, uh, you can basically think that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this idea that from the very earliest ages, human thought is structured around a basic understanding of the world in terms of physical objects, intentional agents, and their causal interactions. What we might call intuitive theories of physics and psychology and the, and the attendant concepts that make up those theories. And again, you know, as, as pe people in this room and in this community have been the leaders in studying, these systems of knowledge develop very early in, in humans, you know, uh, in, in ways that depend on some genetically programmed innate core, but also some kind of learning mechanisms. Uh, they are shared to a certain degree with other species, um, but they are in many ways uh, dramatically enhanced in humans, especially once language starts to kick in, right? And we, we start to have ways of learning that no other um, species has access to. I'm also uh, inspired by the ideas of some of my other local colleagues in Cambridge, people like Nancy Kamwisher, Rebecca Sachs, the idea that there are some, in some sense, functionally specific brain systems that connect and correspond to these core systems of, let's say, intuitive psychology, intuitive physics. You heard about some of those uh, in the uh, social cognition and theory of mind sessions yesterday, for example. Um, and also the idea that, that these core systems in some ways are really, they're, 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 they're the glue of cognition. They are in many ways, I think, properly understood as the outputs of perception, but also the targets of action planning and the original core meanings of language. To put, to put it in maybe a more evocative way, I'm, I'm talking about this kind of thing, right? The knowledge that even these young babies or maybe some other animals have of physical objects and how to manipulate them to achieve goals um, or just play around for fun, like for example, stacking up cups in large towers or stacking up cups on the back of a cat or this uh, orangutan over here who seems to be stacking up large Legos um, until he makes quite a large tower, uh, the famous um, tool using New Caledonian crows and so on. This is, you know, I think of all of these as examples of the, the kind of common sense intuitive physics that we're especially interested in. Or on the intuitive psychology side, again, the classic work of Yuri and, and Gergo and m many colleagues, or Kylie Hamlin's work, um, uh, building on Karen Wynn's work and so on with um, uh, helping and hindering. Um, I'm very inspired by um, the, uh, the studies of uh, Southgate and Chibra. Um, this is a video which uh, I've shown in many talks. Um, and again, you all know it, I'm sure. Um, 
But you know, what is it that makes the, the, here the uh, blue ball look like it's chasing the red ball, and the red ball look like it's going away, or trying to run away, and not just two spheres rolling on a green plane, right? Um, or here's another question, which I'm not sure if there's a way to ask this of infants, but I can ask this of you. When you look at this display here, we all see the blue ball chasing the red ball, um, and the red ball trying to get away. But another question we might ask is, who seems to be smarter? Would you say the blue ball or the red ball? What do you guys think? Who says the blue ball? Who says the red ball? Okay. <laughs> so why does the blue ball look so dumb, really? <laughs> Right? I don't know if you've, if you've ever, uh, I mean, if, if this was intentional or if you guys um, tried to ask this of infants, you can ask this of humans, right? Well, I would say it's because not only does the blue ball, um, well, the blue ball keeps um, trying to fit through some holes that it can't fit through. It doesn't know how big it is or how small the holes are, right? And it doesn't seem to learn. It doesn't seem, it keeps making the same mistake over and over again, right? We watch that. Okay. Um, What's, what's the basis of that, right? Partly why, one of the reasons why I like this, this, uh, this video here oops, is because it, um, it shows how these intuitive psychological concepts, like goal-directed action, chasing and fleeing, um, and, and even the concept of what it means to be intelligent, build on physical concepts, right? As they showed in the experiment, if you take away the walls, if you just show exactly the same motion of the moving objects without the walls, without the obstacles, you don't see it anymore as chasing or fleeing. No, nobody looks smart or dumb, right? It just looks like a kind of a dance, right? It looks like animate motion. But the sense, all the psychology comes from what is basically you know, again, the work that goes back to the earliest stuff that uh, we know of from uh, Gergo and colleagues, the idea of a notion of efficiency or something, right? The idea that goal-directed action is some efficient path subject to the constraints of the environment, which, is, which are really physical constraints in this case, that you can't pass through these walls. And an agent's understanding or lack of understanding of those physical constraints, that's where this core psychology begins. Another uh, you know, classic study, which I don't have to, I, I'm sure, tell anybody about here, but the classic work of Phoenix Wernicken and Michael Tomasello, which, with somewhat older kids, um, again, highlights both the richness of humans' sense of psychology, the ability of, say, these, these uh, young kids, these one-and-a-half-year-olds, to get a sense when somebody needs help um, or, and how to help them, even for somewhat strange actions, like the strange banging the books against the cabinet and knowing exactly what is the right thing to do to help out. Um, but again, part of why I want to show that here is to remind you of how that understanding sits on top of physics, right? It's the banging of the books against the cabinet, right, and the understanding of the physical constraints that in some sense is, is at the root of knowing what somebody is trying to do and how to help them, that I need to open this cabinet and then make a path for them to achieve their goal. So I want to understand how this kind of knowledge works. And I think that if we could do that, we would be, you know, have taken a significant step towards understanding what makes humans more intelligent than any other machine that's ever been built um, by humans. And, um, and, re and really the building blocks of what comes next beyond, say, the one and a half year old stage. Now, understanding these questions in engineering terms or reverse engineering means answering questions like these ones here. What is the form and content of these core systems? What are their representations, let's say? How are they used to support thinking? What are the algorithms? I'd like to understand, and in, in this way, I mean, if you might recognize these as kind of David Marr-like questions. That's my MIT heritage. Um, I'd like to understand also the implementation level, how these uh, systems work in the brain, in neural circuits. And I'd like to understand where they come from, evolutionarily as well as developmentally. I'm going to, mostly what I'm going to talk about here, because this is where we've made the most progress, is on the first two questions. But I'll say a little bit about how these kinds of computations, I think, seem to work in the brain, and something about where they come from evolutionarily and developmentally. One other big question before I get into the, the meat of what I'm talking about um, it has to do with uh, the technical machinery that we can use to answer these questions. So this is not going to be a very technical talk, but it, I at least want to introduce you to some of the tools that we in the computational side of cognitive science have been developing to try to answer these questions. And, and I think this requires us to grapple with some big questions of, you know, what, what, is, what does it mean to compute in a mind? 
I would say that over the history of our field, and that includes cognitive science as well as AI, there have been at least three really good ideas, big ideas at the level of paradigms for understanding intelligence computationally. And I think we've come to realize as a field that we need to draw on all three of these, and, and surely others. But here are, here are um, sort of a top three list, if you like, of ideas that have really proved their worth over decades. One is uh, one that uh, I've worked a lot on and many others that Gergo mentioned, the idea of intelligence as something like a kind of probabilistic inference in a causally structured generative model. So various Bayesian models take this form, or if you've heard of Bayes Bayesian networks or hierarchical Bayesian models or graphical models, or the idea that, that, that uh, what the mind is doing is building models of something like the causal structure of the world and working backwards from effects to causes, from symptoms to diseases, or if you like, from um, images to the underlying scenes in the world. These are all various ways of solving certain kinds of causal inverse problems, which we can't solve uh, perfectly or we can't solve deterministically with deductive certainty, but we can make good guesses having the right, the right kinds of priors, the right kind of more generally probabilistic models, and making good Bayesian guesses about um, the causes to explain the effects that we see. Another important idea, which is really the oldest one in the field, is the idea of intelligence as some kind of symbol processing, or something like symbolic languages for knowledge representation and reasoning. Um, you know, the, the earliest versions of uh, artificial intelligence, but also cognitive psychology took this form. And I'd say if you, had to, um, if you had to make a top one list, if you had to say what is the single most important idea in computation for understanding intelligence, this is clearly the one. <laughs> um, and that's because I would say without this one, we wouldn't have any of the others. We wouldn't have Bayesian networks or neural networks um, or any other kind of networks <laughs> or any formal theories at all um, if we didn't have symbolic languages for expressing abstract knowledge. So that's at the heart of how we do our science, but also how we do our intelligence. Okay. Um, and the third one is one that's had its ups and downs, but is certainly on a big upswing right now um, through neural networks and other kinds of um, you know, pattern recognition technology. But again, it's sort of neurally inspired um, view of the mind as something like you know, finding layers of features in uh, large data sets of experience, right? This is again an idea that is, all of these ideas were, you know, had, have been proposed at the very beginnings of our field. Um, this one has at, at times seemed like it was the way to go, at other times it seemed like it was a complete dead end, but you know, now certainly this is what's driving a lot of the excitement on the technology side. Um, but I think, you know, in my work, I've worked in all three of these paradigms. At this point, I think we've made some progress in trying to understand what are the relative contributions of each of these ideas and what are some of the formal methods that can bring them together. The formal toolkit that we tend to use in our work right now, and some other cognitive scientists too, is what we call probabilistic programs. Um, I'm not, I can't really tell you too much about how they work. I can put up a picture like this and I'll, I'll give you some examples of probabilistic programs. But basically, the, you can think of these as a, as a, para, as a sort of a, a meta-paradigm that brings all these ideas together. Um, a probabilistic program, you can think of it as like a Bayesian network, if you know about those, a, a kind of a causally structured generative model. But instead of being defined on a graph or a network, it's defined on a program. And that gives it much more richness or expressiveness, the ability to have not just nodes and arrows, but data structures and algorithms. That's the symbolic language, that second idea in there coming in, that gives us a much more powerful way to capture concepts. And I think without that symbolic expressiveness of a program, there's no way we're gonna be able to capture core systems of knowledge. You can't express core intuitive physics or theory of mind as a graph, but you can express it as a program. Okay, and then where the neural networks will come in, not very much, but where they will come in is mostly in the interface to perception and ways of getting these kinds of richly structured uh, causal models to work efficiently um, and, and quickly, especially in a perceptual context. The last technical idea, which is again at, at the level of this talk will basically just be a metaphor, but it's a very productive metaphor that has a lot of formal meat to it, is, um, what I sometimes like to call, or the, 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 the slogan is, the game engine in your head. And what I'm referring to here is, 
this is, is the, the part that's going to make this somewhat domain specific. Everything I've said here about probabilistic programs is a completely domain general toolkit to describe you know, anything in human intelligence. Okay, it's, these probabilistic programs are literally Turing complete. Anything that's computable, uh, any probabilistic model that's computable in its inferences, these can handle. But the specific kinds of programs that we're going to be interested in for talking about core systems of knowledge are inspired by and often built on um, kinds of programs that have been developed in an interesting corner of the of computer science or the computer industry, which is the, the people who are designing video games. So I'm, I'm, I think many of you probably know what, what I mean by a video game engine. But just in case you don't, um, here are examples. I think these are uh, maybe the Unity um, game engine. Um, a game engine is a, is a set of tools that allow a game designer to design a, a, uh, a rich game environment, story structure, um, often something like a three-dimensional world that a player will explore from a first-person perspective in some interactive way. And to do this, focusing on the world, the stories, the characters, the objects in the world, without having to do everything from scratch, like write all of computer graphics or physics. So for example, a game engine will have a graphics engine that will, um, that will handle the rendering of the world in real time as a player moves through it. What does it look like where I am now? What about where I am now? Um, a game engine will have a physics engine that will allow you to interact with objects like drop things or throw things or maybe break things or, you know, because most of these games involve various destructive violence, shooting things or crashing cars into walls and you want to be able to model how is the side of this car going to deform or the wall going to be knocked over by somebody shooting a bazooka at it or something like that, okay? I mean, you can put these to more peaceful uses if you want, but... Um, the point is, if you want to have an immersive experience where a player can, in an open-ended way, interact with the physical objects around them, you need some way of handling all those possible interactions and doing it in a way that doesn't have to cap, you know, game, game physics engines don't have to capture the actual underlying physics. They just have to do so enough that looks good, looks right on short time scales with, a, with an emphasis on generality. Lots of different things can be done and can happen, and they have to be very, very fast. Okay. I think these are the same kinds of design considerations that go on in the brain's um, intuitive physics, especially the, the kind that is shared with many other species and develops early in infancy. We can also talk about game uh, planning engines. Um, eight, these are engines which allow a game designer to have a, like a, a non-player character, like a guard of a base or a zombie or somebody, who, who behaves in a somewhat intelligent way. Right? Think about, for example, if you were going to have a guard of a base and a, pl a player is going to you know, go in and um, try to attack a base and you want to have a guard that's going to defend the base. So what would be a smarter versus a dumber guard? And I'm deliberately referring back to what I was talking about with the red and blue balls. Okay? So you could have a guard who just kind of moves around randomly and just kind of shoots in random directions. Or you could have a guard who sort of waits there until they see the player. And when they see the player, when the player enters some, say, cone or line of sight of visibility, then they start shooting at them. And if the player moves, they move, move towards them and keep shooting at them. That would obviously be a smarter um, guard. And there are tools in game engines that will allow you to design one of those you know, slightly smarter agents. Okay? And they have things like line of sight and some kind of simple, efficient path planning algorithms. So the, the idea that we've been working with is that these are the kind of programs that are necessary to capture the causal interactions between basic kind of physical object and agent concepts, the, the heart of, of core common sense knowledge. And by embedding these programs in probabilistic programs, so by embedding them in a framework for probabilistic inference, we can use them to support the kinds of uh, rich, efficient inferences that humans, even very young humans, are making. That means being able to, say, observe the outputs of these programs and make guesses backwards to the inputs and then maybe predict forward what's going to happen into the near future. So let me show you a little bit about how we've been using these probabilistic game engine programs to capture, say, intuitive physics and intuitive psychology in these core settings. So in intuitive physics here, I'm going to be talking somewhat about work that was done in our group a few years ago by Peter Battaglia and Jess Hamrick, both of whom are now at DeepMind, this um, AI company, which I'm sure many of you know about, um, the people who did AlphaGo, and, and that, you know, that's some of their most prominent work. But 
They also have a neuroscience group, which sometimes means cognitive science. And they've hired a number of really smart, interesting people coming from the cognitive science world, trying to integrate that into the AI work that they're doing. Um, so, but back a few years ago, when Pete and Jess were in our group, we studied things like this, these block world type scenes, where we showed people, say, stacks of blocks. These are basically um, sort of synthetic versions of the game Jenga. Probably most of you know that game. Um, and so, but if, you, if, if you do, just think of these as like colored Jenga blocks. And we asked people questions like, um, will this tower or stack of blocks fall over, or how confident are you? And you know, hopefully when you look at these scenes here, you see the ones in the upper left tend to look pretty stable, not likely to fall over. And as you move down into the right, you see scenes that look more like they're likely to fall under gravity. So these are the kinds of intuitions that we wanted to capture in our models. So here's a little bit of a sketch of how we do that. So we say, take a scene like this one in the lower left here. That's a tower that looks like, probably like it should be unstable to you. So see that image as the output of a graphics program. That's a program whose inputs is something like a 3D scene description. What you see in the upper left is one example, like a, like a CAD model, that wireframe set of objects. And the idea is to say, work backwards to say, this is, this is really the, the vision part of the system. What set of 3D objects and their configurations um, would most likely produce that image? That's a guess of what the state of the world is like. But that is also, that's not only the input to a graphics program, it's also the state of one of these game physics engines. These, again, think of these as like approximations to Newtonian mechanics that capture things like collisions, friction, gravity, just at the level that's enough to say, if we were to run this game physics simulator forward a few time steps, we could see what would happen. And here you see, if you evolve a few time steps forward on the top there, you see that, well, these blocks sort of fall over in some ways. So this is, this is one example of a Bayesian inference in one of these probabilistic physics engines. We're making a guess, first inverting that arrow to say, here's a guess at the 3D world state that's, that's consistent with that image. And now let me propagate that forward and make a guess of what's likely to be the future state. Here's another guess. I'll, I'll, I'll go back and forth between them a couple of times. They're a little bit different, right? In the second one, there's a slightly different and slightly worse um, scene percept. Um, but then when you propagate the physics forward and see what happens there, it's more or less, you know, I mean, it's, it's different at the micro level, but it's more or less the same at the cognitive level, namely, most or all of the blocks fall over. So this gives you a sense of how our models work. They make a few guesses like this, and they look at their average statistical properties. And in this case, just one or a few of these samples would tell you the right answer, which is that this is a pretty unstable tower. Most of these things are going to fall over. So now here's an here's a, a example of one of the kind of experiments that we do, where we, um, in this experiment, we showed people 60 of these stimuli, these tower stimuli, and then we got them to judge on a scale of one to seven, how likely was this uh, tower to fall under gravity or how unstable was it? You can ask the question in many different ways and you get basically the same answer. So what you see on the y-axis here is the average judgments of a group of subjects for 60 of these tower stimuli. And what you see on the x-axis is the average uh, judgments of our model, which means the average of a few of these probabilistic uh, physics simulations. And what we're doing in our model is counting the sort of expected number of blocks that, that have fallen and comparing that to the average judgment of people. And what you can see here is that the model does a pretty good job of capturing what people say. It's, you know, the correlations uh, in this and some of the other studies I'll show you are sort of in the 0 0.8, 0 0.9 range. Not perfect, but pretty close. And to me, somewhat remarkable in that we didn't, have, we didn't really do much in the way of tweaking of this model. There's, not, there's no learning here. We're just taking a probabilistic inference in a standard game physics engine. Now, what's probabilistic again about it? Well, there's, in this model, there's two parameters that control two different sources of uncertainty. One is the state uncertainty, which is basically how well can you localize the blocks in three dimensions. And the other is some uncertainty about the forces that are active. You know, we, this, this model knows about gravity and friction and forces of collision, but it allows for some possibility that maybe there's some other forces, like the table could be uh, hit or there could be a wind or something like that. And what we find in this work is that we, we're not really sure we're uncertain about the sources of uncertainty. And it's, it's not that easy to pin down exactly which are the sources of uncertainty in your mental physics engine. But there has to be some uncertainty. And as long as one or the other of those parameters have some non-zero but not large value, the model fits pretty well. What you can see over here in the, in the lower right is what do you get 
if there's no uncertainty. So that's, in some sense, the more accurate model. That's the ground truth physics. So it's perfect state estimation of the blocks and perfect capturing of the physics. But you can see the model doesn't fit nearly as well. And you can see in particular these, these, the red, uh, I guess you kind of, yeah, the red, blue, and purple dots correspond to these stimuli here. The red one is a particularly interesting one because this is a, a tower that I, I'm sure most of you would agree looks like it should be falling over, right? It looks very unstable. Um, that's why it's here very high up. People give it a high instability rating, and so does our probabilistic physics model. But in fact, it's not unstable. It's actually stable. The, the blocks are precariously but, but just perfectly balanced. So in the ground truth physics, it has, it, it's not falling at all. That's, this, that's why it's here over on the left. Um, and so you can see it really, this is, this is one of a number of stimuli, the ones in this upper left corner here, which break the correlation for the ground truth physics. You could think of this as a kind of physics illusion. It's a tower that looks like it should be falling, but actually isn't. And this is, this is an instance of a general class of phenomena that we found in doing this work, that there are a number of things that look like they should be unstable, when in fact they aren't, and, and we think that points to the, the ways in which our mental physics engine is inherently taking into account sources of uncertainty in the real world. Now, this is, this is one proposal that we've put out there for how your, this core intuitive physics works, but one could consider others. In particular, for, for judgments like this one, where you look at some things and you say, well, how stable or unstable or is this likely to fall? Those are judgments that we've done a lot in our experience, and you know, you could, propose, and some people have proposed and built alternative models that are more like a kind of associative learning sort of thing, or more of a pattern recognition style, or maybe even a neural network. So for example, here's an alternative model that was uh, put together partly inspired by some of the work we did um, by uh, some colleagues of ours at Facebook AI research. Okay? So this was uh, led by um, uh, Adam Lehrer and Rob Fergus. Um, and it's, you know, these, are, these are some of the world's best uh, current engineers working on deep learning and computer vision. And they were interested in what happens if we take the, kind of, the same kind of neural network that's been at the heart of recent advances in computer vision, face recognition, object detection, and so on, and try to train it to solve one of these intuitive physics judgments problems basically try to train it not to classify whether there's a cat in the image, but whether there's an unstable tower. And in some sense, they were successful at that. Um, the, most, the, the sense in which they were most successful is that they trained this network on purely simulated images, like from one of these game engines, and it could generalize to real movies of stacks of blocks pretty well. It was even better than humans. I, humans, I mean, as you can see in this, are not perfect because, again, remember, when we compare humans to the actual ground truth physics, they're not, they're not that good, right? Um, if you, at least if you think of physics as being noiseless, and that's the way this network thinks of it, too. On the other hand, this system required a very large amount of training data. They trained it with 200,000 examples of a very limited set of physical situations, just cubes and just two, three, or four of them. Um, and it was able to generalize to other scenes of two, three, or four cubes, and maybe to five cubes. So while it was able to generalize from synthesized images to real world ones, that's significant, it didn't show much generalization to a wide range of physical situations. And it didn't show any generalization at all, or they didn't even really try to see if it could generalize to different questions. Where you really see your common sense knowledge in action, and you can see this, I mean, again, the, the infant uh, physics literature as well as psychology literature is really quite striking here, right? Is the systematicity of your knowledge that is, is, uh, doesn't just answer one question, but, can, but if you've really got some concepts, right, or if you really have an intuitive theory, you should be able to answer an, an endless number of questions. It's, an, it's the analog of what uh, Chomsky famously calls the infinite use of finite means in grammar of language. It's sort of the same idea, but in, say, intuitive physics. So for example, here are a whole bunch of questions that it's easy to get people to answer um, in the domain of intuitive physics. And the kind of models that, that we've proposed, these mental physics engines, or these probabilistic physics yeah. engines, answer all of these without having to be specially trained for any one of them, just like you. So we can ask not only will the stack of blocks fall, but how far will it fall, or which way will the blocks fall? Or we can say, well, what will happen if, for example, 
I tell you something else, like that there, you, you, you see in the upper right that there's blocks of two different colors, and suppose I tell you that the gray stuff is 10 times heavier than the green stuff, or vice versa, the green stuff is 10 times heavier than the gray stuff. That will change your judgments. And it's really quite remarkable, how does it do that, right? I'm telling you something, these are adults, so I'm telling you something in words, um, and somehow those words turn into physical judgments, right? Um, or I can show you scenes like the red and yellow blocks there, which look like they should be falling, but let's say they're not falling. So the, let's say you know, those, those seem surprisingly stable. Then I could say, well, do you think, which do you think is heavier, the red stuff or the yellow stuff? And you can make an inference that one, one kind of material maybe has to be a lot heavier than the other to explain why something that looks like it should be imbalanced is actually in balance. Right? Well, let me show you one other judgment, and we'll do this one interactively, um, because it's, it's, it's a sort of a weird judgment, but again, it shows you, just like, just like we often do in cognitive science, right? by giving you a judgment that you've never really done in the real world, um, we can test what you actually know as distinct from just patterns that you maybe have memorized. So here's the question where we say, suppose I, I have this stack of uh, red and yellow blocks on the table, and suppose I knock the table hard enough to knock some of the blocks onto the floor. Is it more likely to be red or yellow blocks? So what do you guys say, red or yellow? Okay, red. I know it's early in the morning, but let's try all to be here, okay. Red, good, how about here? 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 Okay, so we could do this, we could do this uh, all day, but that's enough. Um, <laughs> So how are, but again, how are you able to do this, right? I mean, unless you've seen this talk before, um, maybe Monte's seen this one before. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, how do you do that? Well, here's, our, here's what our model does, and I think this is, this is a good hypothesis for what you're doing in your head. Um, here we're simulating a bump of the table. It's a little bump. Here we're simulating a bigger bump. And again, notice, it doesn't really matter which one of these you do, although the, the, the fine details of what um, happens are different in each of these scenes. At the cognitive level, the, the macro state is basically the same, namely, all the yellow blocks go over and none or few of the red blocks do. Also note that you don't have to run a simulation for very long. You can see what's gonna happen after just a few time steps in both of these scenes, right? And it doesn't have to be very accurate. So you could run a low, accurate or low precision, let's say, um, simulation for just a few time steps. And that's the way our models work. And they're able to, again, answer questions like this, which are you know, maybe sort of weird questions, but in the course of imagining things and planning actions, this could easily be the kind of thing you have to answer. So I think that when you look at, again, the set of judgments that we make, this approach of, of what's, I've showed you one example of a probabilistic program, in this case, a probabilistic combination or composite of a graphics program and a physics program gives you the way to capture one of these common sense systems of reasoning. Now, I, I also said that there's some role here for pattern recognition or neural networks. And what we, what we currently think, a key, you know, there's, there's, I'm not saying this is the only way, but one place where this comes in is in, in particular, say, this inverse problem. So if we want to invert that graphics arrow, if we want to work backwards, from an image to a world state, and we want to do that in a glance. <laughs> That's a very hard thing to do in uh, probabilistic programs if you think of inference the way often Bayesian inference works in either a lot of the models that we've built in the past or a lot of Bayesian AI systems, where inference is often a kind of a top-down kind of guess and check or hypothesize and see how it fits the data. So things like if you, if you know about Markov chain Monte Carlo, um, in, inference methods like that can be very useful, but often very slow, whereas the main advantage of neural networks is their speed, uh, especially feed-forward neural networks, right? And that's a remarkable feature of the brain, right? Brains are slow in some ways, but they're very fast in terms of how quickly they can make sense of a complex scene. So in some recent work that we've been doing, and the, here I'm mostly pointing to work that's been done by John Jin Wu, who's a current PhD student working uh, with me and with Bill Freeman and also with Pushmeet Kohli, who was at Microsoft Research at the time when, when they did this work. 
is to use neural networks to do what they call, um, or what Jajan and Pushmi call, de-rendering, which means to um, learn to invert a graphics engine. That means the, the, the network is, is being trained not from data uh, in the real world, but purely internally generated data. Think of it as like, um, well, it's, it's what in, in an earlier version of this idea, Jeff Hinton uh, called the weak sleep algorithm, or sort of the, the, the function of dreaming where your, your brain's internal model of the world um, generates your own training data for training your neural network. So you know, imagine that um, what you do when you imagine things, right? You can think of a three-dimensional world and then kind of see what it looks like in imagery or in a dream. And if you have that internal graphics model in your head, you can generate an infinite amount of training data for a pattern recognition system that learns to go in the other direction. And that's the basic idea behind what these neural networks do. They learn from purely internally generated data how to take an image, break it into objects, and recover that 3D scene. Right? And then that provides the input to, um, say, the physics engine. So here what I'll show you is just as an example of combining a neural network approach to the vision problem with a game physics engine approach to imagining what's going to happen next. And you can see these, the, the, there's are four pairs of scenes where the, the, the one on the left, this is actually the, the real world movies generated by that Facebook AI team that I told you about. So these are real images of unstable stacks of blocks. And then what I'm showing you on the right is first a static snapshot that's a reconstructed met, sort of mental image of the scene from one of these neural scene derenderers. But then I'm gonna show you the movie and you're gonna see how the, the physics engine imagines what's gonna happen next. So here we'll watch this in a second. You'll see both the real and the imagined next immediate future. So here it goes. Um, I'll play it one more time. And, and you, you see that in each of the four cases, what actually happens isn't exactly right. So watch again and pay attention to the differences, right? Um, in, in, in some cases, the, this, the tower falls too quickly, or it falls in slightly the wrong direction, or maybe one block falls this way and bounces another way. But for all practical purposes, the difference doesn't matter, right? And for any intervention you were gonna do, should I, should I, do I need to hold here or there? Where, what, where is the instability? This system is able to get that basically right. So for the purposes of planning actions, imagining what's gonna happen next, and planning effective actions, this is a very effective way to do that. Okay. Um, the, uh, of course, our intuitive physics is about more than blocks. Um, and I, um, how, how much time do I have, by the way? Because I realize my time run here isn't quite accurate. 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay. Um, good. So um, we've, we and uh, many others have studied intuitive physics beyond blocks. For example, we've studied things like this, where you know, watching a ball bounce around in something like a billiards table. You can see here this is like an overhead view. There's not gravity. There's just a, um, a ball bouncing around. Here the task is just to predict whether the ball is going to hit the red region or the green region first. And this is another place where a kind of a probabilistic approximate Newtonian physics does a very good job of predicting people's intuitions. I'll show you, this is, here the, I, I won't bother, because time is a little short, I won't really bother with the whole interactive demo. But you can see here, the ball looks like it's gonna hit red, but it slightly misses it and then bounces around for a little while until it hits green. And what, the way our model captures this, this is now sort of a cone of probabilistic simulations that is, again, basically tr simulating the Newtonian motion of this ball, but recognizing the fact that, as, as we and others, this is work that was mostly done by Kevin Smith and Ed Vool and, uh, at UC San Diego, but in collaboration with our group. Um, people's uh, predictions of bounces are particularly noisy. But what, what's, what's very cool about this is even taking into account the fact that bounces are somewhat noisy in your mental simulation, we can still do a, a very good job of predicting sometimes a couple of bounces ahead, sometimes much more. In, in the experiments here that uh, Kevin and Ed did, you can see these are just four of about 100 different scenes that they studied, where even fairly complex motions of several seconds, you could, the numbers here refer to just the number of seconds into the future that people are able to predict. Um, and what you see when you see these traces in time here, the, the two plots are both uh, sort of the empirical data and the model. It's really quite a good fit 
between judgments that people make and this probabilistic physics engine, including all the ways in which people think it's going to be this, and then it turns out to be that. Okay. Now, the, 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 uh, the main reason I wanted to show this is not really to dwell on this experiment, but to connect this a little bit to some studies with kids. Again, this is probably work that most of you know because it was done by Erno, uh, one of your colleagues here, uh, one of the CEU team. Um, and this was a collaboration that we did with Erno and Luca Bonatti and colleagues uh, where Ed Vool and I, basically after we had built an early version of this model and seeing some of the work that Erno and Luca had been doing with um, infants' uh, intuitive physics, we said, hey, we think that uh, we might have a model of some of the things that you guys have been studying in babies. And we proposed some experiments that were basically versions of these experiments. And um, Luca said, well, that's very nice. We're never going to do those experiments. But we've done these other experiments, <laughs> um, the ones that Erno did as part of his PhD thesis, where, again, probably many of you know these, but these are examples of their stimuli, where, um, the, you know, again, the scenes are somewhat different, right? But as we all realized, the same model should apply in these different cases. That's, again, it's not, it's not that much of an infinite use of finite means, but it is, a, it is an example of the same abstract system of knowledge applying in a different case to be able to model, in this case, the intuitions they were studying about how you might expect um, which object to appear after a scene of occlusion as a function of the several variables that they were measuring, which included whether it was the rare or the common kind of object, but also how long the occlusion was, whether it was instantaneous or one or two seconds later, and also um, where the objects were at the time of occlusion. And they did some you know, very... Uh, you know, heroic experiments to study the interaction of these several factors, right? And it turned out that our model would, would, was able to uh, predict, you know, with some degree of quantitative accuracy, how those factors would interact in, in infants' looking time under some very simple assumptions that, you know, are the implicit assumptions in much of the infant looking literature, which says that infants are going to look longer at things that are more surprising, and things that are more surprising to a first approximation are things that are lower probability. And so it was very striking and a, and a wonderful kind of collaboration because all the modeling and all the experiments sort of were done separately, and then we just put them together and they fit, right? It just happened, it just worked because we think that is actually, to some extent, the way the brain works, right? That we were able to take the very same models that we had developed for studying adults' uh, probabilistic intuitive physics and be able to uh, connect them to early versions of these intuitions that were already there in infants. Let me just spend a little bit um, of, of uh, time, less time than I did on intuitive physics, but talking about some of the parallel kinds of work that we've been doing on the intuitive psychology side. Um, so things like these displays here, right? Um, the, uh, the, the, you know, here, um, the basic idea, which is, again, um, very much inspired not just by the experiments, but by the theoretical proposals of Gergo and Yuri and, and their colleagues um, under versions of what you could call a principle of efficiency. The idea that at the heart of understanding action is something like a trade-off of cost and benefits. So we've called this in some form, uh, the naive utility calculus. And if, if you know, I, again, many, many of you might know some of the work that Julian Hara Edinger and did uh, with Laura Schultz and me, and uh, a lot of it has also been in collaboration with Hyo Guan, um, who many of you know, and she's gonna be talking later about some related stuff. Uh, but you could check out the paper that we had in Trends in Cognitive Science last year, I guess it's now 2000, two, a year, two years ago. Um, that sort of explains some of these ideas. But it's basically, the, I mean, the basic idea um, is to understand um, the, fo the, the forward model of action planning as choosing actions which maximize some kind of trade-off of rewards associated with goals and costs associated with actions. And then to extend that, the, 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 the key difference in these models is that's extended over time. So when we talk about planning, we mean a sequence of actions which is designed to maximize the long run trade-off uh, in costs and rewards. And I, what I also want to emphasize is that physics arrow here and how all these scenes, again, as I said at the beginning, the costs, the, but the dynamics of what makes a good plan, and in particular the costs, are defined by your understanding of physics. So in work that we started doing, before we had that uh, nice name, but basically we, work we started doing in our lab about 10 years ago with Chris Baker, inspired by some of the 
earliest work with the teleological stance was trying to study the most basic way that, that, you could under, that uh, adults would understand an agent's goals moving around in a scene um, from, you know, with again some kind of physical constraints and just the basic assumption that an agent would associate some high reward with a goal and some small cost with each step of action. And in work that Chris Baker did together with me and with Rebecca Sachs, we showed that again without any learning or much tweaking, this kind of idea was able to explain with a very high uh, quantitative power, even more so than the intuitive physics models that I talked about, people's inferences about goals. So in these scenes here, we have an agent moving to one of three goals. Here I'm just showing a couple of examples of these scenes. And you know, we can vary all sorts of things. Is there a barrier or is, is there not? Is there a hole, is there not? What path does the agent take? And we can, we can collect, this is the, the kind of data uh, that we collected from, from human adult judges of how likely they thought the goal was to be one of the three objects at each point in time. And then what you see on the bottom are the model predictions and an almost ridiculous correspondence between all the little ups and downs of the model and humans. And that, that fit was not obtained by tweaking a lot of parameters, right? There's just one or two parameters in these models which correspond to like how costly is an action or how close to optimal is the agent. In work that Julian did extending this, he showed that we could also capture joint inferences about not just the rewards, but how costly different kinds of actions were in different kinds of environments, again, with a, with a very high quantitative correlation. And then in work that Chris and Julian did together, which was recently published uh, uh, some, some time ago in CogSci Proceedings, but in a journal form um, in the Nature Human Behavior just again last year, um, they, they showed how, to, how that you could make what are really the beginnings of what I would call real theory of mind inferences. It's not, a, it's not a false belief task, but it's also a joint inference about an agent's goals and beliefs. So here, this is what we call the food truck paradigm, where um, imagine that, uh, uh, I guess here, here at CEU, you have all sorts of wonderful lunch options just in the city of Budapest. But at many university campuses, um, uh, at least in the States, you know, there's not, uh, you know, there's, there's these um, food trucks that come and park in various spots around campus, and you have a somewhat limited set of options, and it might vary from day to day what your options are, depending on which truck has parked in which spot. So that was the inspiration for these kinds of experiments, where we imagine a hungry graduate student who comes out of their um, office over here, and they can see um, one, one of the two parking spots in this part of campus, which is the one in the lower left, they can't see what's in the upper right because it's on the other side of the building. But they do know that there's three different food trucks that come to campus um, on different days. And you can see two of them here. There's the Korean truck, or K, there's the Lebanese truck, or L, and then there's also the Mexican truck. On this particular day, the Korean truck is parked over here. Um, but let's say our student doesn't know what's on the other side of the wall. So what do they do? Well, suppose that they walk here, go past the first parking spot to the other side of the wall where they can now see what's there. And at that point, they turn around and go back to the Korean truck. So now the question is, what's their favorite kind of food? Korean, Lebanese, or Mexican? What do you think? Yeah, yes, um, right, Mexican. Um, so that's really quite interesting, right? And what's their second favorite food? Yeah, so that's easy, right? Um, but again, what, think about what's going on here, right? Um, in some sense, you are, you know, the, e the easy kind of action understanding is people like the things they reach for or they like the things they move towards. But in this case, what we're inferring that the agent's preferred thing is something that isn't even present in the scene. It's only present in our mental representation of their mental representation, right? We think that they thought, or were at least hoping, that, there, that the Mexican truck was there. So they went to look for it. And when they saw it wasn't there, then they turned around and went back to their second choice. That's the story we tell in words. But our model is able to capture that without words by, by basically just assuming that there's a rational plan that's being executed and trying to infer, well, what combination of relative desires and initial beliefs would best predict the sequence of actions that the agent took? Now, in this case, because the agent is taking an inefficient path, or you know, they don't take a shortest path to any goal, 
That's something that has to be explained, right? That's a case where there's, a, there's something surprising. And that, that directly goes together with the idea that they had some kind of false initial belief. So the model naturally posits that the agent had a false initial belief which would explain why it didn't just move along a shortest path. And this is just one of, a num of many other uh, conditions that we tested this model's predictions on. And again, with, with quite high uh, quantitative accuracy, this model is able to capture people's graded judgments about both desires as well as degrees of belief of an agent. Okay. Um, in the, uh, some of the work that we continue to be doing, sort of in ongoing work, um, which I think I will not, I will mostly skip because I want to spend at least a couple of minutes at the end talking about development, and now that should be about now. Um, I'll just point to where this kind of thing is going. And it's also, it's, it's relevant both for AI, but also if we really want to understand um, human core systems of knowledge. Uh, and again, this is where I'm very inspired by the developmental work, where we see you know, a number of experiments um, that involve little dots and circles and boxes moving around, but we also see experiments with real people reaching for things. So somehow, the knowledge that you have, and this is again very different from, say, neural networks that are currently being used in computer vision or AI, the knowledge that you have about action isn't just patterns of motion in, in video that you've seen, but it's abstract. It's abstract enough to capture both how um, you know, a dot moves for something, but also how a person moves for something. So we're, 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 right, right, uh, right now we're doing experiments where we ask the same kind of judgment, but now you see a human moving their whole body for something. So in the scene like this, you might say, well, this woman is reaching for one of these 16 objects. Which one is she reaching for? And we, we'll, we'll show a scene like this in slow motion, and we'll say, when do you think you know what she's reaching for? Probably about now, um, which if you notice, on the right there, that's actually, that, that, um, uh, that's the prediction of one of our models. That's not behavioral data yet. We're in the process of collecting the behavioral data. But the idea is here we have the same kind of model of basically inverse efficient planning, but now the planning algorithm isn't just a little uh, you know, cost for each step, but it's actually using a um, robotic physics engine based motion planner. This, these are, this is from what's called the Mujoko motion planner, which is a state-of-the-art tool for planning humanoid motion in robotics. And what I'm showing you here, I'm not sure how well you can see it on, this, on the screen up there, but what I'm showing you here is examples of, of sort of simulating efficient reaches to each of these possible objects. And then you see these bars going up and down. Those are the Bayesian posterior probabilities. If you try to work backwards and say, which is the most likely hypothesis to explain the observed reach? Okay. And the same kind of model, again, as we have these sort of, uh, you know, using the same model for many other judgments, the same kind of model can explain not just reaching uh, on a tabletop, but action, for example, when somebody stands up like this, and even as soon as she stands up and moves her body in a certain direction, even before she starts to move her hand, you have a pretty good idea of which objects she's likely to be reaching or uh, targeting, or in this scene here, right, again, even before she starts to move her hand, you have a pretty good idea it's one of these objects, or here, in this case, it's maybe one of these objects, right? Or in a scene like this one here, um, can you tell which object he's reaching for? Well, certainly by the time he reaches it, right? But can you see, there's something a little bit funny about this scene, right? He's again not reaching on an efficient path. Can you see what he's doing? Why isn't he reaching just on a straight line? Yeah, there's some kind of thing in the way, right? What, sorry, what is it? Yeah, like a, like a piece of glass or, a, yeah, we, we, we had this, we were inspired by somebody like reaching over the sneeze guard of a salad bar or like in a cafe or something like that, right? Okay, so how do you see that piece of glass? You certainly don't, you know, see it in a standard computer vision sense. You, you know it's there, again, to explain why, you know, to explain his action as a kind of efficient reach. Right? So uh, this, this is, I think, is the power of this kind of technique uh, for explaining real human cognition in the real world, as well as the kind of tools we need to get AI systems to be uh, at, at something like a human level of real action understanding. But they have, at their core, the same kinds of ideas that I think the developmental community has elucidated with much younger humans with much simpler stimuli. 
or to, you know, to, to take this to the, maybe the most interesting setting of social cognition is not just understanding single agents, but understanding social interactions. So what makes the scene on top look like one agent is helping another, or the scene on the bottom look like sort of the opposite, one agent hindering another, right? Um, these were, these are, these are uh, experiments that we started doing, again, inspired, I mentioned Kylie Hamlin's work on infants' understanding of helping and hindering, right? These are, these are adult scenes inspired by the same kind of idea, and um, a model that's, that tries to extend this, this uh, uh, efficient planning model to what we call the multi-agent setting, where now you assume that an agent isn't just trying to maximize their own expected utility, but what is it to be helpful? It's to take somebody else's or your expectation of somebody else's utility function as a positive component of your own expected utility. That's, in, in some abstract sense, what it means to be helpful. Okay. So this is just a sort of a, a hint of where that kind of work is going. Um, to tie it back to the developmental literature, I'll just point to a couple of places where we've used these models either to model um, what, you know, in, the analogs of infants' uh, action understanding, or even to, to help to um, you know, design new experiments. So in work that we did uh, in collaboration with Liz Spelke's lab, this is work that was really done by Sherry Liu, but also with Tomer Oldman's help, um, we designed a number of experiments that were, you know, again, inspired by the kind of, you know, classic, uh, uh, you know, Garagay Chibra jumping over a wall sorts of things, but where we said, okay, well, if, if infants are really understanding action in terms of this kind of inverse planning thing, then they should be able to do graded inferences about how much somebody values some goal from the cost they're willing to pay. And I won't go into the details. This paper was recently published, so you can check it out if you are interested. But the, but the, key, the key insight here, again, is this quantitative trade-off between the cost of action and the relative value, and the fact that the action costs are in, ter in physical terms, right? So the, the, it, it, in this, in this uh, paper, the model, the key essence of the model is a computation of cost in terms of physical work done, like literally um, the integral of force applied over a path. And the idea that that is able to predict both the, the judgments that infants make in this kind of experiment, as well as in another number of other uh, experiments. Um, and I, the, uh, uh, well, I guess I'm sort of running shorter on time than I wanted to, and I want to make it big shorter. Leave some uh, time for questions. But the, um, uh, on the, on the, uh, in, in work that, I mean, the, 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 the helping and hindering stuff that we did was originally, as I said, inspired by Kylie Hamlin's work. And again, if you, so many of you might know the work that Kylie and, and Tomer and others did uh, that was published a few years ago in Developmental Science. But the key idea of these uh, lion flower drawbridge studies was again to emphasize the abstractness that helping or hindering isn't just pushing somebody up a, up a hill, but understanding mentalistically what their goal is and to, to, to um, be able to, you know, the helper to maximize somebody's expected utility, uh, what, you know, whatever that action might be. Okay. Um, I, uh, the, uh, well, I'm running a lot later than I wanted to. Um, the, uh, I advertised, at least, that I would talk about both um, the brain systems and something about how these systems are built. I've talked about a, a few different infant uh, projects that we worked on, but none of them were about learning, right? Um, so what I'll, I'll, I'll skip over the brain part and just say there's some systems in the brain that do these things. I think people, <laughs> well, um, pe people, I mean, people here are quite familiar with the, the uh, theory of mind networks, but um, it, it, the, uh, in work that we did in collaboration with uh, Nancy Kamwisher's lab, this is work that was done uh, by uh, Jason Fisher, um, we've, we've started to study a parallel intuitive physics system, and I'll just say that's of particular interest because we think we can actually uh, you know, start to understand the neural computations underlying that. Um, but just a couple of minutes on development, and then I'll try to leave at least a few minutes for, for uh, questions. Um, if you want to talk about how you might learn or build such a system, that's a really hard problem. I mean, this is, it's a good thing to um, leave for having no time at the end, because 
there's, because it's such a hard problem <laughs> that it's, it's mostly pointing to future work. Um, but what we want to do, what we'd like to be able to understand is to say, if you have, if your knowledge of intuitive physics, let's say, is something like a probabilistic physics engine, then learning that, developing that, should be some kind of program that builds a program. And we should be able to take the, the whatever stages of knowledge that infants go through. So here I'm just pointing to some of the classic work from Rene Bayerjan and colleagues, um, looking at, say, the concept of stability over the, the, and how it develops over the first few months of life. And we should be able to say, okay, well, can we capture the different stages of knowledge, let's say, that infants seem to go through in understanding what kinds of uh, support is physically stable as, in some sense, different stages of a physics program? And can, and can we come up with some kind of rational learning mechanisms that might explain, based on the experience that an infant gets, what that transition looks like? Okay. For those of you who know the kind of work that I did in the past that Gergo mentioned, things like hierarchical Bayesian models of, of learning, we'll, we can certainly apply these to these cases, and we've done some of that. Um, so here's some work that, again, Tomer Ullman did in trying to model how people would infer, say, the masses or the forces in play in physical scenes using one of these hierarchical Bayesian models, and it can do an okay job at capturing what people do there. But it doesn't really get at the hard part of the problem that matters for development, right? And what I, want to, what I want to leave people with here is the sense of the hard problem that remains to be solved, which we and I hope others will be working on in the future, right? If you want to not just say, estimate the parameters of a physics engine, but actually learn the structure, like learn the form of the program, that's a much harder problem. It's not even clear necessarily what the right form of the hypothesis space is, or what would be an effective way of searching that space, or what amount of the work is done in the actual life of an infant from experience versus more by evolution. Um, a picture like this, I think, is illustrative, right? The reason why neural networks have been so popular in engineering is because they lead to very nice learning problems. They lead to smooth optimization landscapes, the space of weights of a neural network, where you can just follow the gradient downhill, and as long as you're willing to wait long enough, you'll get to the, the bottom of things. You'll get to the optimal solution. But if you talk about the space of programs and any sensible cost function on it, it's a much more complicated space, and there's not good algorithms for searching around in it. But I think this idea, the game engine in the head idea, at least does provide a way to think about what the structure of that space is like. I think it's, I mean, this might seem very natural to some people and crazy to others, but, but I'll put it out there anyway as, as, as you know, where we want to go in the future. The idea that what evolution gives us is something like a game engine, the kind of tool that can be used to model all these different games that, uh, the world of now technology presents us with, and that learning or development is something like figuring out which game you're actually playing, right? Programming the game engine in your head to fit your experience. Again, this is something that we've been exploring that really Tomer Ullman and Liz Spelke have been exploring, where in a recent uh, TICS paper, they talk about how the kinds of hacks or approximations that game physics engine makes have a striking correspondence to some of the classic kinds of funny things that infants seem to do in the intuitive physics literature. And Tomer has suggested that you might be able to capture some of the different stages that infants go through over the first year of life as, in a sense, kind of learning how to use these physics engine hacks. Like, for example, the idea that you approximate bodies as some kind of convex shape and not, just, and not the detailed geometry of the physics. Or the idea that you might sort of posit joints to make sense of why things seem to be stable or not stable. This is, these are tricks or hacks that physics engines use to approximate much more complex systems in simple ways. And the idea that infants might be learning how to use these hacks is an interesting, I'm not saying that it's right, but it's an interesting proposal for what could be the process of learning over the first uh, couple of months of life. It's sort of a version of the child as scientist idea, which is a sort of classic one in in development, but it's, it's maybe another way to put the way we think of it, and this is the thought I just want to leave you with, um, is what we call the child as hacker. It's sort of the algorithmic side of the child as scientist. The idea that if the form, the, the representational form of your knowledge 
your theories is something like a probabilistic program, then learning is some kind of programming in a sense, right? Um, what, by, hacker, by hacker here, I don't mean the sense of people who break into your email and steal your credit card numbers. I mean what we at MIT call hacking, which means like making your code more awesome, basically. And if you think about all the activities of hacking on your code, all the ways you as a, you know, whenever you write code, um, work on your code to make it faster, uh, more accurate, more elegant, more explainable to others, more transportable to other problems. I think all of these have analogs in children's learning. And what we're going to need to be able to do is to be able to describe these algorithmically. There's some exciting tools from what's called program synthesis in machine learning and programming languages. And I'll just, I'll just mention the fact that it's, it doesn't, like if you want to say, can, can we come up with automated programming algorithms? It's not completely crazy that we could do that. All right. So I'm sorry to have gone somewhat over. I was trying to give you a sort of a big sense of both where we've gone and where we've been. But just to wrap up then, the program of research that I've been trying to tell you about is how do we describe the core systems of knowledge in engineering terms? And that means a number of different questions, OK? Um, and I've tried to give you a sense of how a set of tools that combine our good ideas about intelligence, the ideas of probabilistic inference, the ideas of symbolic representation languages, and neural networks and other tools for pattern recognition, that by bringing these together into the toolkit of probabilistic programs and the game engine in your head idea, we're at least beginning to make progress on these, on these hard questions. But I've also tried to gesture at what are, I think, the, the, the bigger, more, more interesting open problems in future work, both on the cognitive development side as well as on the AI side, where some, in, in, in my own work, what I'm uh, most excited about going forward is considering this, what is maybe the oldest best dream of AI, going back to Alan Turing's original proposals, um, the idea that we might build an AI system that grows into intelligence just the way a human does, that starts off like a baby and learns like a child. In every wave of AI excitement, this has always been what people have come back to as possibly the route to build real AI, because in, in the known universe, it's the only scaling route to AI that actually works. right? I hope what I've tried to at least show you is that we now have not the answer to this or not the ability to do this, but at least we have, we understand what it would be like to try to build an AI system that starts like a baby and learns like a child. And I think it's exciting to see in the coming years whether we might be able to actually make good on that idea. Okay, thanks. And that leaves us only five minutes for questions, but if there is any. Mati. Hey, Josh. Uh, beautiful talk, thanks. Um, this might sound as a disappointingly down-to-earth question, but I'm asking this in the hope that it might actually open an interesting uh, discussion, which is, um, as we pretty much all guilty of it, um, the, the way we are testing these models is that we are comparing model predictions to the average of subjects' behavior. So we, if, I, if I interpreted your result graphs properly, yeah, no, that's then right. those are averages across subjects, yeah. each point in those yeah. scatter plots. Yes. And so I'm wondering whether there is something to be learned about the patterns of intersubject variability around that average, yes. averages. And yes. in this seems particularly a burning question for rational models like yes. the ones you're building. Why aren't people individually there if, yes. if, this, if the underlying assumption of these rational models really holds? Yes. No, that's a great question. And I'm, um, we have some good answers to that in, in that in that paper in the supplementary material. But I mean, again, I think you know, you know this work, and it connects some of our interests. Um, so just to, to, to make the uh, larger context. It's not just in the work I showed you, but in most of the work that people have done in probabilistic models of cognition, and in fact, in most of the work in mathematical models of cognition period, what one does is model the average subject. And it's, it's of great interest what, does, what goes on in individual people's minds, and is there any information inside the variability across what different people do, or what one person does across different trials or different encounters with the same stimulus. And what we've found, and, and what you guys have found in some ways too also, is that actually there is a nice correspondence, but it tends to not be between, I mean, well, it, it, rather, rather it tends to be between 
um, one or a small number of samples from the Bayesian posterior and what individual people seem to do. In other words, individual people do have some variation, which in many of the experiments that I talked about here can be well described as if what they're doing is not taking an integral over all possible uh, ways the world could work, but just choosing one or a small number. And we, they're in, uh, a paper, there's a paper that Ed Vool and I and uh, Tom Griffiths and Noah Goodman published a couple of years ago called One and Done, which tries to explain from a rational point of view why one would uh, make individual judgments just taking a single sample from a Bayesian posterior where the rationality isn't at the level of the computational theory or the inductive logic, but in terms of rational use of cognitive resources. If drawing samples is costly, and you look at the cost-benefit trade-off of how much to think or how many samples of a distribution to take, in many cases, if you're making a bunch of small decisions, each of which is only, you know, only has a small effect on your overall utility function, then in many cases, the rational thing to do is just to take one or a few samples make the best guess you can and move on. Now in the experiments I showed you, like the intuitive physics ones, we, can, we actually did that in the supplementary material of that paper. We, we compared the variation in individuals to the variations in our model, and we tried to make an estimate of how many samples people were taking, and the best number we could come up with was not one, but somewhere between you know, five plus or minus two. So on, you know, three, on the order of three to seven um, samples. And that doesn't mean, I don't, that's just suggestive, but I think what we find in a number of these experiments um, is that one or a small number of samples is both uh, uh, descriptively adequate, but also, um, I think, rational at the algorithmic level. Thanks for the amazing talk. Um, I was wondering if you thought about putting all of your um, individual different domain specific uh, programs together in some way and, and how, how you could tackle the idea that a baby is not just doing physics at one time and then looking at agents, but they're oh. confronted with a busy scene. And if you, if you need something like a model of executive function to... Yeah, that's a um, great question. Um, well, so I, 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 I don't think I did a great job. I, I was trying to make the point, I, I just didn't leave enough time, I think, for the intuitive psychology to do this, which is intuitive physics is all, I mean, is all wrapped up inside this. So, there, I mean, it's, it's very important that the physics and the, psycholo the psychology builds on top of the physics. But I think you're asking a bigger question even than that, right, which is... Um, how do you deploy your cognitive resources? Um, I mean, in many ways, there's the question of how, like, um, how does a, as a person or a baby set up the models that I set up here, right? I think that the, a lot of the hard work that's done in these models is taking a scenario or a stimulus like you know, any, any of those like food trucks or chasing stimuli or whatever, and turning it into a formal model, right? That's the work that the modeler does, right? Turns the scene into math. Um, th that same hard work in all of AI is also always done by the human, not by the machine, okay? And that is an example of something that human mind has to do for itself, right? Um, that's, I think, one of many places where you might say, um, you know, the ability to do that very generally is gonna require maybe, you know, maybe it's executive function or it's at least some kind of domain general uh, cognitive capacity. And I think that might be one of the differences between what you see in young infants and what you might see in the ability of older children and adults is the ability to take these same kinds of mental models and deploy them outside of the context of, you know, somebody reaching for something or somebody moving around in the immediate spatial environment. Um, in our work, we've often tried to focus on these cases which don't require a lot of um, extra executive function work. But I think it's, that would be something interesting to look at going forward. Um, we haven't tried to model that formally, but the tools of probabilistic programs should allow you to do that, right? You can write, in the same way you can write a probabilistic program, which is effectively a program building program to handle learning, you could write a probabilistic program which is a program setting up program, which has some more abstract knowledge and tries to basically write the specific program um, in the moment which describes this scene, deploying some more general abstract system. And I think that it would be interesting to, to uh, explore that more. Okay, maybe the last question. 
Hi. Uh, I have a question about the uh, adult's perception of um, social actions, like helping and injuring. So you showed there a video, say in the injuring case, you showed a video of an adult that is approaching uh, an object yes. and another taking it away. So my question here is, uh, what kind of assumption is in the model that allows an uh, observer to interpret the action of the one taking away as a social goal. So if you think locally, actually, that action itself is entirely efficient. So on an efficiency basis, you would uh, also can exhaust the interpretation at the level of individual goal. The agent wants the object. So what kind of further assumption allows the system to go one inferential step further and say, no, the utility function, in fact, embeds the utility function of the other agent? Right. So um, uh, the, um, we, we have a partial answer to that, um, and it's, it's actually rather related. I mean, the, the things we've done also haven't done are, are very related to the answer I had to the last question. So um, what we have done is to set up a hypothesis space of possible uh, kinds of social interactions as well as being non-social. Like consider the following ways to have a utility function. You could have just your own utility function, which depends on your goals, or you could have a utility function which depends in a positive way on somebody else's or on a negative way on somebody else's. And those would correspond to basically three different orientations, like just a self-interested or pro-social or anti-social or hindering. So what we've done um, is to set up models which have that space of possibilities and then can do inference over those, can infer which of those an agent seems to, to have. This, the, the place where we've done that is in um, this paper, which I, again, was going too fast at that point and sort of mostly skipped over. But uh, Tomer Ullman, together with a number of colleagues, Chris Baker and others, we had a paper at NIPS um, some years ago, I think it was 2010, on help and hinder. And, and that was a paper with adults where we tried to model adults making these judgments in simpler kind of grid world scenes about whether an agent was, had one, or, one of these three different orientations as well as what its goal was if, it was if it had its own goal or if it was trying to help what the other agent's goal was that it was trying to help or hinder to achieve. So we, we can build models that, and it's a kind of a hierarchical Bayesian model that make inferences about um, both what your social orientation is as well as what the agent's goals are. But what, we, what that builds in is the, um, is the space that says this is, this is what it is to basically be an agent, to either have a utility function or to have a positive or negative dependence on your expectation of another agent's utility function. Um, we're not talking about how you would uh, learn that sort of idea in the first place. And it's an interesting question whether infants learn that or whether that's part of our genetic endowment, right? It's quite possible that if there's some kind of core social cognition, that is th that, that hypothesis space of you know, a relatively small number of abstract kinds of utility functions is built in, and then you, have, you, know, you do inference in that space. I think that's an open question that is part of what we want to explore. I talked about how we might build models of learning or developing a physics engine, and I think we, we are interested in exploring the analogous kinds of things in terms of one of these um, intuitive psychology engines, but it's mostly an open question um, you know, whether you could do that and also what infants actually do. Okay, okay. thank you again. Thanks.